took a bit of a, a different approach to uh, to this conference than a lot of the speakers. Um, a lot of my work is, is kind of really technically focused. Um, but the thing that I think really kind of drives the practice is uh, how we propose grand ideas. Uh, so I wanted to take this presentation as an opportunity to kind of look forward and see where we might be in 20 or 30 years so that we can start thinking about um, the baby steps that we have to take today to get there. Um, a lot like Christopher Alexander's pattern language. Um, it was, you know, not something that was really useful at the time, but it was something that kind of progressed the field and brought us to where we were at today. Um, so my presentation is called Urban Acupuncture Through Algorithmic Zoning, the Evolution of Big Data in the City. Um, and that's a bit of a mouthful, but I'm really going to break down this concept throughout the presentation. And you're going to see that I'm speaking about these two main ideas of urban acupuncture and algorithmic zoning. And I'm looking at them through the lens of current efforts to integrate data analysis into urban planning. Uh, so, kind of, first of all, I'd like to provide a little bit of context for understanding this conversation. Uh, so, in architecture right now, we're seeing a trend of design analysis. Um, that's something that I think everybody's familiar with. We've talked a lot about today. Um, it's taking a model design into like Sapphira or Grasshopper and then performing environmental analysis. Um, and that approach is really beneficial because it provides some hard data for how we evaluate design options. Uh, and also because it really fits into the analog process of development. Um, I mean, this is a, a design cycle. It's pretty pretty self-explanatory, but it's basically this uh, this cycle of how we take um, expert knowledge and analyzation, and we kind of um, create this cyclical cyclical process that uses the intuitive, informed design decision making along with analysis. Um, and the design analysis tools are really great because they can kind of help to uh, reduce design cycle latency and speed the process of how we approach things. Um, so if you look at a firm like Big, uh, their workflow looks a lot like this. Um, for every project that they do, there's something like 100 models that they develop before they get to the final form. Uh, and this works really well for like big firms and places that have the budget to do pre-design. But, you know, what about some of the smaller firms? How do we kind of take this, uh, this idea and make good design more accessible and more democratic? Uh, so that's where I think that really this, this second approach comes in. It's, and it's this idea that we can design in performance. And, I mean, a little bit of this was, was covered in, in Eric's and kind of his approach, I felt, was like a, a great example of this. Um, because it's basically, instead of... Instead of taking a standard design analysis approach, where we're using computation to kind of take this, this model and to, um, to step forward a bit, to, to speed the iteration in the first half, and to kind of re really quickly arrive at these, these decisions that are going to be closer to the final product that we can, that we can work within. Um, and the ability to do this really depends on like how accurately we can define our parameters, how much our relationships that we create within the program really represent what's going on in the real world. And the quality of the output is really dependent on that. Um, but if we do correctly, if we do it correctly, we can see that it really has the ability to drastically reduce the amount of time that we spend in pre-design stages. Um, and basically, you know, if you, if you look at the options, like this was a study I did for one of my studio projects last year, and these were basically all of the different configurations that I came up with off of, you know, four different parameters. Uh, so you kind of have these, these millions of possible ways to do each design. And it's like, how do you, how do you take it and narrow it down to this, this just a few options that you can, you can move forward from? Um, so a lot of my work right now is really centering on this idea of designing and performance. Uh, I think that it's really going to be the next great evolution of, of how design uh, happens. And my work is a lot about uh, how it applies to both architectural and urban design. Um, so now that we've talked about that for a minute, uh, I want to just kind of put a pin in that idea and come back to it. Um, 
in the context of algorithmic zoning, but first there, there are two other ideas that I'd like to touch on real quickly. They're kind of the ideas of the, the smart city and uh, urban acupuncture. Um, so the smart city is something I think we're all familiar with, and it's right now it's a lot like sustainability was a couple decades ago. Um, you know, for a lot of years, sustainability was this buzzword. It had no meaning. It didn't really help us in our approach. But through development of the theory of sustainability, uh, with tools like the triple bottom line, systems thinking, um, we really figured out how to how to define the term and define the concept and be able to start to use it in a, a more meaningful way within the practice. Um, so I think that the, the smart city is going to kind of be like that. Uh, the more we d define it, the more useful the concept is going to be. And so for this talk, uh, my favorite definition is basically that the smart city, um, it's, it's about what it does. And so, so we can say that this is what the smart city does. Um, through data collection analysis, a smart city leverages its ava available resources <coughs> to improve the quality of life for as many of its citizens to the greatest extent possible, and in a way that enables a systematic evaluation of its policy. So we, we can really see uh, how well it's working if it's doing what we think it is, and that will kind of drive the development of policy. Um, and the last concept I just really wanted to quickly introduce, I mean, I think all of you kind of probably know about it, but. Uh, urban acupuncture is the idea, and there's, there's really one aspect of this that needs to be highlighted for the purposes of this talk. Uh, and that's the idea that, that urban ac acupuncture uses small interventions relative to the urban scale, and it, uh, it uses them to catalyze a larger change. So uh, this, uh, this project is a really good example, I think, of urban acupuncture. And it's the uh, Civic Victory Garden in San Francisco. And it was a project by Rebar. Um, they basically took 10,000 square feet of turf in front of the uh, Civic Center, and they replaced it with a temporary garden. And while that garden was there, it uh, made the public space more used. Um, it also provided around 100 pounds of food per week to the local food banks. And so, it was it was a project that that made that changed the site greatly, but it also provided services within a larger urban context. Um, so now that we've got this background, there are really kind of three points that I'm using to explain the concept of algorithmic zoning. Uh, the first is that we seek to design in performance to find ideal solutions to design problems. The second is uh, that urban projects should seek to solve multiple problems simultaneously, um, basically for the most efficient allocation of resources. How do we do more with less? Uh, and then the last idea is that that of urban acupuncture, you know, how do we create larger change from small projects and how do we make sure that in addition to doing what they need to do, they kind of provide uh, greater urban services as well. Um, and it's kind of funny because, you know, just from these, these three ideas, we can start imagining uh, what a systematic approach to urban design might be like. Um, but when we keep kind of layering more information on top of this, it becomes really hard to grasp the overall picture and how this idea might work. Um, so, Basically, basically, the question becomes when we talk about these levels of complexity, uh, like how do we focus on really accurately solving single questions and then defining relationships between them to kind of build a network of these that we can use to look at larger issues. Um, so the idea is basically that we're using computation to move beyond the limitations of what we can conceptualize and into an area where predetermination of the outcome is, is basically impossible uh, from the start of the project, but it, uh, it becomes concrete as it goes along. Um, so basically, due to this, this kind of limitation, I um, thought that the best way forward would be to 
kind of talk about an example that demonstrates uh, how we can create relationships um, and start to build algorithmics, algorithms within the context of zoning. Uh, so here in San Diego, I mean, we, uh, we know that urban runoff is a big issue, and uh, Sandeg tells us that after just uh, 0.2 inches of rainfall, um, water contamination advisories have to be issued. Uh, and this is this is a lot to do with um, how you know the storm water just kind of discharges to open water through a drainage system. And there's kind of a lot of I think really good efforts to address this through the development of best practices. Um, but the the issue with that approach is that it can only kind of solve the problem within new development. And so uh, the real question here becomes like how do we how do we create a solution? that addresses uh, the built environment that's not going to change, that's not going to get more permeable paving, that's not going to get more infiltration. Um, so kind of the idea for doing that was basically that within each watershed in the area we can identify areas of collection um, and that past that we can look at uh, the, developable, the developable areas uh, and where they align with areas of collection. So we can kind of find opportunities to specify a project that can provide a, a way to address these issues of urban runoff um, without being a large project, but being in, in the sense of like private design, uh, private development. Um, so if we if we look closer at one of these targeted areas, we can we can imagine that this this is maybe how a traditional development in that area would look like. Um, but basically, by modifying the codes, we can reduce the allowable coverage and specify filtration landscaping to get something that looks more like this. Um, and kind of as a trade-off for those limitations, we can we can take this idea and say that we can increase FAR to reduce the financial incentive for development. And it'll kind of allow for the creation of this, this little pocket of a really unique and really uh, beneficial development within the neighborhood. Um, so through this approach, uh, we kind of created this really simple relationship between topographic features, uh, FAR, and allowable coverage. Um, and this kind of showcases how codes can be modified to design and performance uh, and to incentivize private developments to provide greater services. Um, and really, it's, it's kind of interesting with that example because it's something that we can currently do and a lot of people are doing through manual analysis. Uh, but the real idea of algorithmic zoning comes in when we start to look at how we increase the complexity of the issue by kind of layering relationships and data. Um, so this is kind of, you know, a larger picture of San Diego with a lot of the, the information uh, overlaid. And we can see that, um, that basically as you overlay more and more information, the lots kind of get more, more specific in their, in their needs and in their relationship to the larger, larger urban area. And so by building these more complex models of relationships and of trade-offs, we can identify places where we can create symbiotic relationships between different sorts of parameters. Uh, and in that way, we can really find areas where we can get the most bang for our buck and embody the ideas of urban acupuncture. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of this loose, loose definition and explanation of this idea. Um, but it's important to note that it really didn't appear out of thin air, but it represents this evolution that we can see in urban design where we're trying to approach uh, kind of a fine-grained specificity and regulation and a more intelligent application of tools. Um, so kind of the digital development um, of this idea began in the late 1980s with expert systems that were used to solve very specific problems within urban planning. Uh, they didn't really see much success because they weren't creating larger relationships. Um, it continued with this uh, UDST, which was um, the Urban Data Systems Toolkit, uh, and Urban Sim was a, a project that was part of that. 
that's basically um, it's basically the idea of design analysis, but on a on an urban scale. Um, and so, so that kind of brought us to this idea that uh, because that's now becoming effective, that we can we can really manage the creation of those complex relationships to to analyze it. So we can we can also kind of take that farther to the idea of designing and performance in the urban environment. And so that's where this concept came out of was algorithmic zoning, and it was really briefly kind of independently proposed by these two futurists in the late 2000s and early 2010s. And uh, their names were Alex Eric Gardner and Alexandros Washburn. Um, so based on my research in this subject, I really believe this is going to be the, uh, the future of problem solving for complex urban issues. But how it looks and how it is applied is really going to be very different depending on depending on the city and depending on the context. So uh, developing these specifics here in San Diego is is going to be something that someone will do, and you know I hope that it's one of the people here. <laughs> um, so kind of to close this up, since I've been talking around the issue for a lot of it, I really want to provide a couple of concrete conclusions uh, about this idea that can kind of guide discussion on the topic. Uh, so the first one is that algorithmic zoning is really about the definition of relationships. Um, so it's a self-explanatory concept, but it's, it's really important because uh, by kind of building this, this network of relationships, we can start to really understand and evaluate the complex systems that we live in. Um, the second is that the framework for this really has to be open source. Um, this is important because by building in transparency, we can really preemptively address these claims of bias that are, that are pretty likely to arise with a system like this that, that creates really variable zoning within the urban area. Um, and it's also necessary because it can kind of provide, uh, it can encourage collaboration between cities, uh, which is going to make application more successful. Uh, the third is that standardized data collection analysis really is necessary. Um, the ISO recently started work on this uh, with the creation of this 37120 standard, uh, which encourages accurate comparison between developments developing smart cities. Uh, and the, the fourth and last is that uh, cross-disciplinary collaboration is really going to be required. Um, it's kind of similar to the idea that that no one person can comprehend an entire system of relationships at one time. Um, no discipline really contains enough knowledge to, to address this problem that I'm talking about. Uh, so collaboration and cross-pollination is going to be required between computer sciences, uh, urban planning, and designers. Thank you. <laughs>